Well, let's get going. Um, thanks for joining us tonight for this. I am so glad to be back. It's been a couple of weeks, and it was a great time with the wedding, and it was everything you hope a wedding will be, plus 10%. Um, it was beautiful and wonderful and peaceful and drama-free, and Owen Amber played, and it was awesome, and we had a good time. And that necessitated some break. So thank you for understanding. No meeting last week. We went to South, we went straight to South Carolina from, the, from Tennessee and, and worked from over there and rested a little bit, and it was awesome. So, But I'm excited. I'm excited to be back. We get a lot of feedback from Galatians. A lot of people are following this journey and taking it with us and enjoying the journey and asking where is it. And so that excites me to jump back in and and get going with the Apostle Paul in this amazing fourth chapter. If you haven't explored Galatians 4, that's for the viewer, that's for all of you, and you just sit with it for a little while and watch Paul go to work on some things that um, nobody else goes to work on. We're going to cover one tonight. Tonight's lesson is titled, Accept, Accept the Adoption. Um, when I say Paul goes to work on some stuff others don't, I literally am talking about this. Paul does work on adoption in the New Testament. No one else does work on adoption. There's some interesting things that's been lost across the years of church history. It's amazing when you go study the church fathers or the patristic fathers of what they emphasized versus what we emphasize. That's not to indicate they were right, we're wrong. It's just sometimes maybe that's the case. But it, it's just to say that different time periods emphasize different things for different reasons. Uh, it's amazing the stuff that, that got lost. For instance, we have almost no early church writings on Jesus' new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. The early church fathers loved, love the Lord your God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. It's part of our prayer forgiveness. Very little writing, very little preaching on a new commandment I leave you, love, your neighbor, love one another as I've loved you, which is just, to me is the new covenant commandment that we're asked, that we're told to keep. Uh, very little. It's kind of amazing that that slides through the cracks. You don't see the revival of that for years. Um, Paul's the only person in the New Testament that mentions adoption. And we don't have a codified expression of adoption as part of our salvific experience until the 16th century in written church history. Like, it was part of preaching. I mean, people talked about it. They wrote about it a little bit. But as far as we are the adopted sons of God. The church never bothered to write that down as its expression until after the Reformation. Um, I, I'm, not, it's not a stone, I'm not tossing stones with that statement. I'm saying it's amazing how some things fall through the cracks, that they, we emphasize one thing and we leave another alone. So we're going to get into a topic tonight that I think is pretty familiar. The last, especially in the message of grace, message of the finished work. We talk a lot about adoption. We talk a lot about our inheritance because we talk a lot about the finished work. So it's kind of hard to imagine that, that this, there was a time in the church when you know, people didn't really think about it, didn't really know about it. But this is a topic that is that way. And when you consider that only Paul talks about it, that means that maybe it wasn't even widely talked about amongst the church of the first century. Peter's not writing about it. James isn't writing about it. John's not writing about it. Adopted into the family of God. Um, I'm going to get into why tonight. I'm going to take a stab at it. Why is Paul the one? Um, uh, we're going to do things a little bit different tonight in that we're going to do some teaching up top on the verses like we always do, which is basically what we do every week all the way through. And then we're going to do some topical teaching on adoption through the lens of Rome and, and Judaism. And that'll require a lot of us reading stuff that we've written down. And, and so this will be a little bit different, but we'll bring it back into the Galatians letter before we're finished tonight. What I really want to walk away with is the concept of adoption um, through a different lens than the Western world. Because when we think adoption, it's different than when Paul said adoption. And so if we can think more like Paul and less in our culture, then we'll get a little closer to maybe a little closer to what Paul was talking about when he said it. I'm going to start with some verses we actually read last time we were together, but it's been a couple weeks, and this is a slow move. In Galatians 4, we really have to slow down because the theology is so thick in every verse. There's so much to say. So let's start with two verses from Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. When the fullness of time had come, 
And you remember, we walked through every one of these from verse four a couple weeks ago. The fullness of time come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. The whole purpose of this is to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. There's our phrase, adoption, and that's what we're going to work on in a little bit. This is an interesting passage in that this is the closest we get in all of Paul's letters to a Jesus bio. Consider that Paul's writing in a world that does not yet have Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Of course, they don't have John. John's last, but John doesn't give much of a bio anyway. None, they don't have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They don't, well, Mark doesn't give much. But they don't have the nativity. They don't have the virgin birth story. They have it orally. They don't have it written down. So we don't, Paul, one of the interesting omissions from the writings of the Apostle Paul is a lot of stuff about the person Jesus. Um, Paul actually seems to lean the other way. Rather than talk about physical Jesus, he talks about resurrected Jesus. Paul loves to use the phrase Christ, Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ our Lord. Because for Paul, the Jesus that he met was not the Jesus that walked the shores of Galilee. It was the resurrected Jesus that meets him on the road to Damascus. So the message that Paul preaches, he preaches through the lens of a resurrected Christ, which in my opinion is why John sounds a lot like Paul, because that's the gospel Paul would write if he's going to write one on Jesus. And so Jesus, Paul sort of leans the other way to say, mm, it's not about knowing him in the flesh. It's about knowing him in the spirit. That's why he says to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, we knew him according to the flesh. Now we know him that way no longer. And thus we can't judge anybody according to the flesh because we don't even know Jesus that way. If you don't know Jesus according to the flesh, what do you think you know about somebody else whom you don't worship? Okay, so that so part sort of runs the other way. But if you need a bio, this is it from, from what I can find. This is about as close as it gets. Paul goes, yeah, he's full time. God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. There it is. That's what I want you to know about physical Jesus. Pre-cross resurrection. But he did it all to redeem all of us who were born under the law. Now, Paul's great argument is that the whole world is confined under sin under the law. When you read the Romans letter, Paul starts by comparing Jews and Gentiles. And then on his way through that comparison, he goes, well, you know, Gentiles do all these perverse things. That's most of Romans 1. He gets to Romans 2 and he goes, oh, but calm down, Jews. You're no better. For those of you that think you're better, you're not better. A Jew's not really one anyway who's a bloodline Jew. He's one who's one of the Spirit. He's transitioning. By the third chapter, he goes, oh, you know, righteousness has been prophesied by the law and the prophets, but it's been fulfilled in Jesus. And so everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but Christ justifies all through his blood. And so Paul's really working at establishing the equal guilt of everybody. You get deeper into Romans, he goes, God can find all under sin, Romans 11. God can find all under sin so that he might have mercy and compassion on everyone. So Paul would not accept the modern argument. Well, Gentiles, it's not really for you because you were never under the law. Mm, Paul would say, no, you put yourself there every second of every day. You were always putting yourself under some form of performance. You were always putting yourself, and you may not have been under Mosaic law, theoretically, but you've been under some law, and that's why you're operating under the curse of this system. Okay, and that's why Paul says in, Gal in Galatians 3 that Christ came to redeem us from the curse of the law. So whenever he says to redeem those who were under the law, we talked a couple of weeks ago about how that's to redeem those who are under that curse of the law so that we might receive the adoption of sons. This verse was in my consciousness for a long, long time. It was always, it was, it's there. I've been reading the Bible since I was a kid, been preaching since I was a kid. So I knew it was in the Bible, but I didn't have a real revelation of that, I don't know if it's because I thought, well, Jews are the ones under the law, the message of Gentiles is different. I don't think I ever thought that deep through it. But I do know that this was a verse that helped release me from the burden of toxic religion. I'm not an anti-religion guy. Um, I think pure religion undefiled is a thing and, and should be attainable through faith in Christ. Pure religion is the journey to the Father, and that's what we're, we're all part of that journey. Toxic religion is, 
everything else that masquerades as journeys to the Father, but it's really just all about our, us and our performance. Well, I've been under my share of toxic religion. I've preached toxic religion. I've sold toxic religion and spewed toxic religion, and most of us have. And my own transformation was rooted in this idea that those of us who were under the law have been redeemed from it and then adopted as sons, but it took me a while to get there. Like, I didn't know this verse, so I went through a different route. I want to share that verse with you. You know it. I've shared it before, but I want to share it for those watching who maybe are new to this journey. You haven't been watching long. You're really into this message, and you think, gosh, I need to know a little more. Give me a little depth. Um, when I say be released from the law, this is what it meant to me. This was the verse that did it for me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. I gave you one extra verse too to show you some context. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach, stomach for foods, but God destroys both it and them. Now the body's not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. I leave that 13th verse there with it because I'm going to work on that for just a little bit. I, I know this sounds like I'm in the weeds because we're really talking, going to talk about adoption, but I felt like this needed to be said because this was the verse that one Saturday morning, nearly two decades ago, I was reading 1 Corinthians 6 and read this verse for the 10,000th time in my life. And this little alarm bell went off in my spirit. And the alarm bell was a mixture of excitement that I wasn't under the law. First time I'd ever even considered that possibility. But also fear that something is wrong with this. That I think it means one thing, but it probably means something else. Because if it means what it sounds like, then all things are lawful which is exactly what it says. But if it doesn't mean that, and I go down a road of all things are lawful, well then, you know, I'm in trouble. You know, I'm going to lose my soul. I didn't have Galatians 4. It was in my Bible, but I didn't really have Christ born of a woman in the fullness of time to redeem those of us who were born under the law. I didn't have that the law was a curse. It's why, I, as I got deeper into this, I realized that Galatians had fallen between the cracks with a lot of people as far as seeing it as a, the real constitution of a new covenant and, and how the things that Paul lays out there is for us to see. And so the reason I left 13 up was to show you that it wasn't just dietary law we get released from because Paul puts, the, he puts diet and fornication in the same, essentially the same paragraph that all things are lawful because he's actually talking to them about sexual matters, but then drops in this thing that is a, is a backdrop of the Corinthian letter, which is, can you eat anything you want? And so in the middle of an argument about sexual immorality, he drops in this foods, but he puts the tent of all things are lawful. And you got to decide what you're going to do with that. Okay. You have to, because you're going to be confronted with law over and over and over again, both in society and in religion. And law is not necessarily a bad thing. But laws that choke the life out of you or laws that cause you to save you become law that are not the law of liberty. And none of the law can bring you salvation. So I wanted to, I wanted to give this just as a way of... Because I thought, well, there might be some person who's really enjoying the Galatians journey, that they're just on the road with us, but they've got their own stuff. So I want to throw the verse at them that was the verse for me, that, that I went, wow, okay, I got, I got to dig. Um, all things are lawful. It's been my response now for going on two decades when somebody asks me what I think about something. I go, well, all things are lawful. I mean, that's what the scripture says. Now, if you're asking me what I think it'll do to them, well, that's a different question. Or if you're asking me if I think it's a good idea, oh, that's a different question. Or if you're asking me if I think they should do that, that's a different question. But if you're asking me, oh, can they? All things are lawful. I mean, go ahead and insert whatever you want. Paul gives you a couple different options there to argue with. He doesn't just leave it alone. In fact, he's so big on the four chapters later, he says it again. 
So it's not just a fly-by-night phrase for Paul. He circles back in the 10th chapter, says the same thing. This time he adds, some things don't edify my neighbor. His way of going, oh yeah, I can do what I want, but some things tear people down. So, you know, think about that, which is another way of going, our whole thing's supposed to be loving our neighbor. So if it's lawful, but it doesn't love your neighbor, what do you think? But he always leaves it there. Like, it's yours. What are you going to do with it? So I leave it there with you. Christ has died to free you from the curse of the law. Christ died, dare I say this? Christ died to make all things lawful. So that you are not defined by the do's and the don'ts of the law. Now you do with that what you will. And here's some equipment. The equipment is found in the fact that he redeemed you from the law and adopted you. So he didn't just set you free and let you run. He set you free and gave you his name. So the liberty that comes with being freed from the law is not a liberty to just be whatever, but a liberty to be one of the sons and daughters of God. And that needs preached as loudly as we're freed from the law, which is why we cannot preach a message of releasing people from the law without a message of adopting people into the family of God. And if we had an idea what adoption meant, then we might have less to argue about about whether or not we should be doing some of the things we're doing or we shouldn't be doing some of the things we're doing because we would go, well, I have a dad. I have a name. I have a home. I have a heritage. And what does that look like if I'm a follower of Jesus? Okay. Put all that together. (laughs) Work on that in your own work. Walk that out in your own life. But let's go back to that great fifth verse. And let's put it up with some of its buddies. I do this because this is the core of tonight's lesson. It's accepting and receiving. I go Galatians 4, 5. This is for our listeners, not our viewers. I wanted to read these off for you. Galatians 4, 5, John 1, 12, and Romans 5, 17. But I want you to notice there's something similar in every one of them to redeem those under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. That's our text. John 1, 12, as many as received him to them he gave the right to become the children of god romans 5 17 one man's offense death reigned through one much more those who receive abundance of grace the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one jesus christ it's obvious the word that we're emphasizing the word receive the word receive comes from the root word that is translated as accept and so rather than receive the adoption i say accept the adoption because it's kind of a word people use a lot in our culture I don't accept what they say about me. I don't accept this lot in life. I don't accept what's being done to me. And we understand acceptance in a, in a way as a mental assent to or something that we embrace, something we take into ourselves, accept or reject. What we're asked to do as followers of Jesus, as adopted sons and daughters of God, is not earn it, live up to it, jump through hoops to get it or to pay for it, or deserve it. We're asked to receive it. We're told to accept it. Accept the adoption of sons. For those who receive him or accept him, he gives them power to call themselves the sons of God. And if one man died and everybody's guilty, then if one man succeeds, then everybody gets to accept the abundance of grace. Christianity is all about acceptance. It's all about receiving whatever it is that Jesus has done on your behalf. And I think for too long, I've told you this a hundred times, so here's 101. For too long, we've made Christianity about doing right, being right, and living right. And we're falling so short of the beauty of what it means to just believe on the one who is right. When Jesus says to Peter, I just preached this Sunday at the garden, when Jesus says to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you like wheat, but I am praying for you that your faith not fail. Notice what he doesn't say. Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you like wheat, but I'm praying for you that you don't mess up. He doesn't pray that because messing up is paid for in Christ. What's he praying for us? Not perfect lives, act perfect, live perfect, do perfect, never fail. Believe. What's believe? Receive. All I'm asking you to do is receive whatever I do for you, he says. I pray that your faith not fail. I pray that you stay in receive mode instead of do mode because do mode's easy for you to flip that switch on and think you got to go to work for God now. Just keep that mode in receiving mode, the route for accepting him. All right, let's turn the page on that 
I, I, we could be there all night on receiving. What's the difference in receiving and not receiving? Well, we've probably all of us lived it out. And part of walking into the revelation of God's love is realizing that we don't have to earn it and pay for it and bleed out for it every day, but we just receive it. And receiving it comes easier sometimes than it does other times. And it's, to me, that's the fight of faith. I mean, we're told to fight the good fight of faith. What we're fighting is to stop doing and start believing, to stop paying and start receiving. And it's easy to get back in pay mode and fall away from receive, receive mode. I wanna encourage you to practice being a receiver. And it, it can be as simple as, Father, I don't know how to receive your grace. All I've ever known is, I, is I'm working for it or I'm trying to earn it. Teach me to be a receiver. And what does it mean? Sometimes I, I'm realizing I'm holding too many things. And maybe receiving is just letting go of some stuff because I'm holding on to myself and my pride and my anxious, my, my, I don't know, I, you, whatever. You, I, I, I seem like I pick different stuff up all the time. <laughs> like, I, you know, like I have, I've got a good grip on this faith thing. And then, then I realize I'm not gripping faith at all. It's just me working really hard and trying to please God and then let go of that. And that's the gentleness of, you know, of walking this out and knowing that all he's asking is us to keep believing. Son, just keep receiving. Don't try to earn. With all of that in mind, what are we receiving? We're accepting adoption. We're accepting that he did the work and that he adopted us. But I want to talk about that for a minute because it is one of the most misunderstood concepts, I think, in New Testament theology. As I said to you earlier, it's an underpreached aspect of New Testament theology. It's a very cornered aspect, being only Paul. And so we don't have it being talked about across the spectrum of the New Testament. And that, uh, that doesn't mean it doesn't matter. It, it, it just shows us that there's a limited understanding and a limited knowledge. I want to get down to why. So let's start with just talking about adoption as a concept. It's from the Greek word, huothesia. And it literally is to be placed as a son. Placing, not just taking, but placing into something else. So if you are adopted, you've been placed. Um, we use the phrase as placing children in a home. Okay, like foster children have been placed in a home. It's rooted in, ad adoption's rooted in that idea of placing. Okay, it's not a taking, it's not a choosing, it's, it's placing. New Testament times, which is what we're dealing with, Jewish adoption was non-existent in the legal code, fully formed in the Roman code. That's not surprising. It's spoken of in five places in the New Testament, all of them by the Apostle Paul. For those listening, Romans 8.15, Romans 8.23, Romans 9.4. I'll let you look them all up at home. Ours, Galatians 4.5. And then the famous Ephesians prayer from Ephesians 1, where Paul talks of forgiveness of sins and accepted in the beloved and adopted. And there's very close roots to accepted and adopted as well. Um, but in, the, in those five instances, it's only Paul, three of them in, the, in Romans. We'll get to one of them. We'll get to one other one tonight because I thought it was fair to go to one more and try to round out what we're talking about this evening. I want to leave that alone for a little bit. I just want you to think about the fact that there is no Jewish adoption. Okay, why then is it only Paul? Um, Paul, peculiar to our other apostolic writers, is Roman. Now it gets lost on us sometimes that he is Jewish, but we only think of him that way, don't we? I do. When I think of Saul of Tarsus, he's a Jewish man. He's a Roman Jewish man. Now, he doesn't brag about being Roman, but he's not beyond using it if he needs it. Like, he gets arrested for the cause of Christ, and he throws out his Roman citizenship because his Roman citizenship gives him a different trial. Then if he's a stranger, then hey, use it if you got it, right? And that's how we learn that he's Roman, is he brags it up pretty good. In fact, the book of Acts ends with Paul on his way to Caesar because he's appealed all the way up to the top of the food chain. Pretty remarkable thing. It's not just like any Roman got to go see Caesar. We don't know for sure if he made it. He dies sometime during the reign of Nero. Did he get to go talk to Nero? That would be pretty cool. Hope to find that out when we get to heaven. Um, in any case, we don't know, but we know as a Roman, he had that sort of in his back pocket. Now, I bring all of that up because 
We think of him as Jewish. He is. That's his religion, and that's his, his sort of his bloodline heritage. But his nationality is Roman, and therefore, being an educated man and easily our most educated named writer of the New Testament, depends on who you think writes Hebrews, <clears throat> but I'll go down swinging that it ain't Paul. Um, whoever writes Hebrews might have more education, at least in the way they write their Greek, but maybe there's nobody more educated than Paul, which means he's not only educated in Judaism, he's not only educated in Torah, he would have had a, what we now call classical education. And as a Roman man with a classical high-level education, he would be pretty well-versed in Roman law. And he would understand some things about Roman law that his peers don't. And he is not beyond dropping into his theology Roman concepts in a world familiar with Roman concepts. And so that's why we have to work on this from a Roman point of view when it comes to adoption, because the Jews didn't really have anything. There was nothing written in is Jewish slash Israeli law about adoption until 1960. We, it's the late middle 20th century before they bother writing anything down about adoption. And so we can't re reference the Old Testament as to what it looked like to adopt. So we have to borrow from the Roman Empire. Let's do that. Here's a few things we want to talk about tonight in regards to this. This is kind of a long one. Some of this is just literally reading. It's just study material, but it kind of helps us, I think. Adoption is naturally understood, and this is kind of across time. We all naturally understand it to be the process by which a person leaves their natural family and enters another family. Okay, so if you just say to someone, I'm gonna adopt a kid, then that's what you're gonna do. That's essentially, regardless of when you've lived, that's the main thing you're doing. But in Roman times, adoption was almost always for the benefit of the adopting family. Think about that. It was for the people doing the adopting but they did it so that their bloodline did not die out, so that they had someone to leave their stuff to. It was very rarely for the benefit of the adoptee. Now, contrast that. Our society has a view of adoption in which unfortunate children are given the benefits of family. I, that's a very broad statement. I realize that people adopt for a thousand different reasons. So I don't want to say that it's all for the same, but you got to admit, our concept of adoption is often used in relation to kids who don't have parents first, rather than parents who don't have kids. And so we'll go, well, they, you know, there's adoptive agents. They could be adopted. It's, it's the great argument that people want to use, whether pro-choice, pro-life, is, well, those kids can be adopted. And so for the benefit of the kid, that's our, that's our society's idea. It's why a lot of adoptions happen to overseas kids. Go find underprivileged kids from a third world country and adopt them so that their lives are better. Okay, so that's for the benefit of the adoptee. This was foreign to the Romans. Thus, it's most likely foreign to the Apostle Paul because he doesn't have a Jewish concept. He only has a Roman concept. He presents adoption then in his world. If adoption is for the benefit of the adopting family, then adoption is not God making your life better. It's God making you his heir. So when Paul says you've received the adoption, it's not Paul going, hey, God did this so you'd live a better life. He did this so you would do better. No, rather, God gave this for his benefit. He loves you. He has something he has that he wants to share. Couldn't he just give it to angels? We can get into theological arguments. Couldn't he just give it to angels? And we, I think we go down the wrong roads a lot of times. Where is creation? And being his creation, he wants to leave something with us. So it's not, and this is why I said a moment ago, we get too wrapped up in making life better. Because if you don't have to live very long to know that Christianity is not a recipe to get making your life better. Like you don't come to Jesus and he go, well, that's it. That's the end of sorrows. No, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's I, you have me with you in the sorrows. And so it's not an end to the issues. It's him giving what he has to us, not simply to improve our lives, but because he loves us. So if through the eyes of Roman adoption, it is for the benefit of the family, and Paul knows that, then to tell Christians that they've been adopted 
is Paul saying it's because God has something he wants to give you. He loves you so much, he wants you to be a part of who he is. Okay, let's add to that. Here's another adoption concept, New Testament. Infant adoption was almost non-existent in the ancient world. In fact, I don't think we have it on record of Romans ever adopting an infant. Um, you wouldn't have to. Like if you really wanted an infant, you had like 50 slaves. The, the paterfamilias just slept with somebody else. I mean, I, I know that's crude, but that's the world they were in. So there, it wasn't an issue of like, we got, we're gonna have to adopt. And so the adoption then was to give, was never for an infant, because you're not going to give your inheritance to an infant. And, the, and it wasn't about raising them. When Paul states that we've, quote, received the adoption as sons, he does not indicate that we receive the adoption as children or infants. He could have used a different Greek word. He doesn't. King James has messed us up here because the King James says he has given us the adoption as children, which kind of led to this spiritual immaturity thing that new converts are spiritually immature, which probably they are, but I've also found that old converts are spiritually immature too. I mean, this idea that because you got saved three weeks ago, you're super young in the Lord, but you got saved 30 years ago, you know some stuff? Ha! I mean, I've met a lot of people who've known Jesus a long time, still don't know. Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> maybe so. But still don't know how to follow the Holy Spirit. Still don't know what he sounds like. Still don't know the difference between their own and him. And, uh, and we've all been there. So that's a roller coaster. Probably depending on what it is we're talking about as to our level of knowledge or maturity. But so when Paul talks about adoption, if he's thinking Roman, he's never thinking babies. So he's not adopting a bunch of babies. He's adopting fully grown sons. This indicates that we're fully grown in our inheritance. We may not be fully grown in our maturity. I mean, yeah, true. We may not be where we need to be or where we're going to be, but we are fully grown in our inheritance. Well, I'm putting these up here just so you'll start to think differently about adoption. So maybe now if you use Paul, just think about the way Paul's as a Roman talking about it. You go, well, God would adopt if he's like Roman, if Paul's using Roman adoption. And why am I bringing all this up about Rome? John doesn't talk about it. Peter doesn't talk about it. James doesn't talk about it. None of them are Roman. So maybe they don't talk about adoption because they don't have any idea what they're talking about. So they don't ever say, hey, you've been adopted into the family because that would be, they're Jewish first and foremost, and they don't have a concept of it. Paul's a Roman going, hey, let me borrow from my secular knowledge here for a minute. It's kind of like the Romans do. They adopt. And what do they adopt? They adopt for their own sake. They adopt because they chose them. They adopt because they want to give something to them. And if that's the case, then my salvation is that God wants to give something to me. Why did Paul say receive the adoption? Because it's God giving it to you. Receive the adoption of sons. You're not some little baby. You're fully grown, which means you get the fullness of the inheritance. You don't have to wait and wait and wait. Here's some more. Since, let me, next one. Since Romans adopted adults, and they always did, they took on the previous debts of the adopted, and thus they canceled them by paying them off. By the way, this leads to something else. Adoption was not, you go, we, we don't have a concept of adopting adults. Okay, and so we think, we always think infant. But an adoption was often uh, someone who was very important to your family, Julius Caesar does this with his nephew Octavian. He adopts him as his heir. This is the reason why when Julius Caesar is killed, Octavian believes that he should be the rightful heir and not all Romans agree. And thus we have the great conflict of Mark Antony versus Octavian. That bloody battle goes on for years and culminates in Mark Antony and Cleopatra and You've heard the story. And finally, it's Caesar Augustus, the august one. But he, he coins, he's one of the first, he's the first Roman emperor, and he's the first emperor to put his face on a coin. And when he does, he calls himself the son of the God because Caesar was his uncle by blood, but he was his dad by adoption. And so that's what mattered to him because he saw Caesar as a God. 
So he takes the name Caesar then, and that he is, and all of this has got to be there in Paul's head. It's got to be. He knows his history. He knows, and it's not even that far back. That's like a hundred years ago for Paul, which sounds like a long time, but you know, for us, Paul's 2,000 years ago. So it's not all that far. It's pretty much in the consciousness of what's going on. And so this this inheritance. So they adopt adults. They take on whatever the adult brings to the table. So if they adopt an adult who's deeply in debt, the second they become their heir, they have to pay all those debts off. That's what being the paterfamilias is. That's what being the head of the family is, is to incur the debt. So whatever you owed, you brought to your new father and he canceled it. The new father then owned everything. And thus the new father had the rights to discipline. The author of the book of Hebrews gets to the 12th chapter and talks about us being disciplined. And he goes, if you're not disciplined, you're a bastard. You're not a son. He's leaning into that idea of when you made a commitment to Christ, you gave up your rights to not be disciplined. You can't have it both ways. You can't bring him all your debt and go, hey, will you pay this off? And dad goes, paid off. And then say, yeah, but I don't want to do anything you tell me to do. Now, why bring this up? Because all things are lawful, right? You get to do anything you want to do. But if you remember that dad paid off all your debts, that becomes your checks and balances. That becomes you going to the father saying, all I am, I owe you. All I have, I owe you. All I owed, you paid. And I don't owe anybody. And even though all things are lawful, you have the rights of discipline over me. You have the right to tell me, I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to do that. And oh, I can argue that I'm allowed to because I'm a full grown adult. (laughs) But I've also put myself under dad's discipline. This is why the question of are all things lawful? Yeah, but there's a lot to the story. You know, if we want to go deeper into it, adoption's a reason why, that's an, another reason why we need to go into adoption. So the new father owns everything. I love this last one. If he owns everything, he's also liable for the actions of his adoptee. So get this, once you're adopted in Roman law and you break the law, it's on your new father. So he's taking on your future debt as well as your past. So when Paul says you receive adoption as sons, he's put everything you are tomorrow into Jesus. You can't lose, man. You got a father who paid off all that you brought to the table when you met him. And a father who's willing to pay off all you bring to the, to the table now that you've met him. If it wasn't for his, it it feels lose-lose for him. You know, like we feel lose-lose. Like I got to take on all of this and whatever else. It ought to show us the love our father has for us. And Paul caught that. He got it. And and like no other writer did and lays that out there so that we'll think about this might be, might be, might be what Paul means in Colossians 2.14, when he says something no other New Testament writer says, and I'll use the NIV because it says it better. Jesus, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he took it away and he nailed it to his cross. King James, old King James says he has taken the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, and nailed it to his cross, moving it out of the way. That's a fine thing, but the NIV, Wow. He canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness put on the cross. And maybe that's another adoption term for Paul to say, when you came to him, he took everything you owed and he put it in him. Uh, Here's another thought. Fathers could sell their sons into slavery in the Roman, in the Republic. It's different. Roman Empire, laws start to change under the empire. But under the Republic, a father could sell his sons into slavery. And if he was released by the owner, then the slave had to go back to his father. In 450 BC, Roman law changed, declared that when a son had been sold three times by his father, then the father ceased to have any authority over him. So there was a limit under Roman law to how often that your father could sell you. And once he sold you, 
enough. And this might be why Paul talks about things like sold under sin, because when we're under the father of this world or the God of this world, who is willing to sell us for parts, that's sort of that lingo. He might be having that in his head when they talk about some of those terms. And this might be another reason why Paul talks a lot about the father redeeming us or purchasing us. And so he never has the father selling us or selling us off. Let's put those verses together that we started with tonight. Let's add a couple more to it as we head into our landing. Galatians 4, we did 4, 5. Let's reread them. When the fullness of time come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Redeem those under the law that we might receive or accept the adoption of sons. And because you're sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if you're a son, then you're an heir of God through Christ. Um, this contains together the great theology of our adoption and our ability to call our new father, father. Because on the back side of adoption, Paul does something quite fascinating. He uses Abba, a word that was not Hebrew, not Greek, but Aramaic, the street language of Paul's day. A little odd for Paul to do. And Abba translates very close to father. But he uses the Greek word for father on the backside of it, Abba Father. It's almost like saying Father, Father. But he doesn't by using Aramaic and Greek. Abba was a word that was like, uh, like a homophone, you know, like bam. It sounds like what it's spelled like. So little kids said Abba. It was Dada. It was as close as you could get to dad and not be able to speak the language. Why is that remarkable? He just told you that you're adopted. And in his mind, you're not adopted as infants. You can't be adopted as an infant. You're adopted as a fully grown son. That's Roman law. So why in the world are you calling him Abba? It's almost a contrast. It's almost ironic. And it's beautifully precious and poetic. It's Paul saying, even though we're fully grown sons with full rights of inheritance. And he brought us in, he paid off all of our debts, and he's got our tomorrows. We're so in awe of him that it's like we call him daddy. It's like, it's like he hears a kid outside of his window as he's writing the letter to the churches of Galatia, calling for their Abba. And he uses it. And we don't have any knowledge that Paul has heard. The, the gospels don't exist in Paul's world. So we don't know that Paul has heard of the story of Jesus calling his father Abba. He does, but Paul does too. And maybe it's because the revelation that Paul had of father was like a dad, like a little kid, even though I know I'm a fully grown son with full inheritance and he brought me in, he paid off all my debts, but it's like I'm a kid with a dad who so greatly loves me. We'll, we, we land here. We are sons and daughters of God. I'm trying to put it all together in one paragraph. We're all sons and daughters of God. We've been claimed by Him. We're fully grown and thus we're full heirs of His goodness. We're bought by blood and His death is liable for all we did wrong and it's liable for all we'll do wrong because He made a payment and we're His kids. We no longer owe allegiance to our former master. That's something I didn't say a lot about tonight. I th kind of thought it was obvious but probably should hit it a little bit. When you were adopted, you were no longer your old father's kid in any way at all. He wasn't your dad. He wasn't your biological father. He wasn't your birth father. He was nothing. He was gone. You either belonged or you didn't. There's no half in, half out, okay? And that's not a statement about works. That's a statement about purchase. You're, you're, you're his, in other words. He's got you. Uh, we're no longer allegiance to our former master. I used, the close one we get is Ephesians 2, 3, where Paul says you were, uh, you were one time disobedient. And he goes, you were children of wrath. Paul never called, this is as close as we get to knowing what Paul thought, who our old parent was. 
Well, you got to play a little ABC here. A goes to B, B goes to C. Uh, you used to be under, you were children of wrath. What's wrath? Paul says to the Romans, the law works wrath. Therefore, if the law works wrath and we were children of wrath, maybe we were under the law, Galatians 4. And so we're no longer under what it was we were under now that we've been adopted. So quit going back to what you were under. He's not your dad anymore. You don't live in that house. You don't get credit from your old dad because you did good this week. There's no, you don't have no dad's old credit card. Let it go. Be free. You're not part of the children of wrath. But now you owe your allegiance to your new father. Your debts are paid and he holds disciplinary rights over us. All right. Galatians 4, 6. Remember this. Your sons, he sent his forth to have a father. Let's land in Romans. I want to show you the other. One of the other five adopted and I want to put it next to Abba Father. Romans 8, 15, 16. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. You received the spirit of adoption. By whom we cry out, Abba Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Principal difference often gets lost. In Galatians 4, we cry Abba. In Romans 8, the Holy Spirit cries Abba. So both us and the Holy Spirit are crying Abba Father, which tells me that when I don't cry Abba Father, He's still crying Abba Father. He's still praying Abba Father. And the beauty here, this is worth a whole week, won't do it, but... Didn't receive the spirit of bondage again to fear because we've been under bondage already. But when you come into the new house, you're not a slave anymore. Sounds a lot like what he says to the Galatians. You are no longer slaves, but you are sons because you are heirs in Christ Jesus. What I want you to do with this, accept it. That's it. Just accept it. Receive it. Start the process of receiving it. Whatever's keeping you from receiving it, lay that down. You want to talk about repentance? Yes, Christians need to repent. This is the stuff we need to be repenting of all the time. Father, what am I carrying around that is keeping me from receiving what you want to do for me? And why do I keep holding on to it? I repent. I change my mind about this. I don't want to be under my old spiritual, biological father of the law anymore. I don't want to spend his money. I don't want to use his name. And I don't know how to let go, so help me. And that keeps us, it keeps us humble. It's the only place we can live is realizing that we don't know what we're doing and that we're just receivers. And I receive of his goodness, grace upon grace, receive of his fullness, grace upon grace. For those who receive abundance of grace, we reign in this life because we have accepted that we are adopted. All right, let's pray and make that your prayer. Just as simple. I'm not asking you to call it out loud, but just think about it. What have you got that you can lay down? Father, I want to be a receiver. I want to accept adoption. I don't want to earn it. I don't want to pay for it. Because all that really does is insult the payment. You've done this. And so, Father, I repent of all of the areas that I haven't accepted, but I've just kept sliding my spiritual credit card across the counter at you like I had done enough or that you were, uh, I owed you something. Father, I repent. I change my mind about it. I change my mindset about it. And I want to be a receiver of your adoption and a receiver of your goodness. And I thank you that it is done and it is finished. And I thank you for everyone here and for everyone watching and everyone listening and for whoever's interest was piqued tonight by the, the idea that they're no longer under the law. I pray that their interest has been equally or exceedingly piqued by the idea that they are adopted. Because if they can get that adoption part, then Father, I know that all things that are lawful will make sense. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this week's program. If you would like more information, please visit our website at paulwhiteministries.com. Here you can find thousands of sermons, shop for Pastor Paul's books and series, and become either a monthly partner or a one-time donor. You can also visit our church website at midlandsgardenchurch.org. For written correspondence or to donate by check, Write us at Paul White Ministries, P.O. Box 1030, Flowery Branch, Georgia, 30542. Join us again next week here in the Garden of Grace.